Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I am the director of the Geo Institute, and that is why we call the show Director's Cut. Every week, I sit down with another GI member who has a story to tell and questions to answer. Some of them are professional. Some of them are personal, but as I like to say, all of them are fun. If you like what you see today, and I think you will, click on the little button below the screen that you're watching this in the the, uh, video box that you're watching this in that says subscribe, then click it again to get notifications and you will be notified every time we post a new video to our YouTube channel, which is frequently. Today, I am really happy to be joined by Bob Holtz from the University of Washington. He is a past president of the GEO Institute, been involved with ASCE for many, many years, which you will hear about in a few minutes. And he is the international secretary who, I don't know, he's technically not on the GI board, but he goes to all the GI board meetings and he is a vital part of that group. I think that is the important part of it. So, Bob, thanks for being with us today. You're very welcome, Brad. And I think we're going to have we're going to have some fun. We will start with the same question I start everyone with. Describe your job in 45 seconds. Well, that's easy since I'm retired. Uh, it's as one of my, <clears throat> my friends said one time, it's the best job he's ever had because he can't get fired. <clears throat> In my case, uh, I don't have to worry about budgets. I don't have to worry about clients. I don't have to worry about irate students or deans that don't like me or whatever. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, job. It's, every day is Saturday. That's another thing to mention. I like that. I, I, I aspire to that someday. It's it's worth uh, worth aspiring to or for or whatever you do. Before that current job of retirement, you of course had an illustrious career in the field with many publications. Anybody who's taken a look at your CV is probably I, I can't imagine they wouldn't be impressed. Which publication in your career are you proudest of? Well, thanks for asking, because I happen to have a copy right behind me. It's this second edition of our textbook that Bill Kovacs and I wrote. Oh, my gosh. In 1981, I think, was the copyright. And uh, we, we got kind of lazy and slow in our old age, so we got this young guy, uh, Tom Sheehan, to go as a third author and kind of light fire when we needed to and uh, we got the second edition out exactly 30 years from when the first edition was published (laughs) which was still in print by the way which is quite remarkable but i think this i have to say was uh, my i'm i'm the most proud of this i've written some other papers that i like and think are making major contributions but i have to say this is it that is excellent. What was there a moment when you were writing that textbook that you felt like it wasn't going to happen, or was it pretty much smooth sailing the whole way through? <laughs> well, we, Bill and I started on it probably ten years earlier, <clears throat> and we couldn't seem to get going and had disagreements about where things ought to be and whether we should put in foundations and blah blah blah. And finally, we said we got to get a third opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and from then on, things really moved. You know, we we set up a schedule and and got really serious and had weekly Skype meetings or one of those other things in those days, and it worked out pretty well. And um, got the publisher excited, and so that helped. So my final question about the textbook is how do you even get to that point that you decide you're going to do that? Were you guys approached about doing it? Did you decide on your own? And what was the initial spark to make it happen? Well, we both of us worked at Purdue at that time. And um, we weren't happy with the undergraduate textbooks that were available. And that's usually when <laughs> you start thinking about, gosh, you know, I think we could do a better job. And we were approached by a guy that was kind of a a, a professional textbook publisher. 
<clears throat> at some small school up in in Illinois, and uh, Joe uh, Joe Bowles was his name, and he, I don't know the first chapter we got it was pretty awful the first four or five chapters and and finally uh, well. Um, I shouldn't tell you too many stories about that. I can spend the whole day on that. But <clears throat> finally, I went into Bill and I said, you know, I think we can do a better ourselves. And there were several other things in there that finally pushed him over the over the top that w- this would be better to do. And so we did it ourselves and and uh, just made sure we didn't take any of the material that he had prepared earlier. And had a slightly different outline, different chapter organization. You know, a few things that you could say yeah. yes, we were separate, and and uh, the rest is history. It works Excellent. out really well. So we hop around a lot on this show, and I feel bad for the people who don't like sports and who don't like music and who don't like science, because those are really the only three things I ever think about in my life. And yeah. so I've managed to work them into the show, too. I know you're a pretty big Mariners fan, being out there in Seattle for a while, as you have been. What is your most memorable Mariners moment? <laughs> wow. Well, there are a number of them. Uh, the year they won 116 games and then died during the ALCS and a few things like that. But uh, one of the most exciting events was uh, my nephew was living in this area at that time. <clears throat> in fact, it turns out that he's visiting us now, lives down in Las Vegas and and uh, just picked him up last uh, Monday from for uh, staying here for a week with us. Anyway, he uh, he and I went to the Mariners game, and they were playing the Yankees. And it's like the Yankees are sort of like Boston, they ha- or Notre Dame. You know, they've got <laughs> team cheerleaders around the country. And so the place was loaded with Yankee fans and their, whatever the colors they have and all that. <clears throat> and they were getting whomped. The Mariners were. Ken Griffey Jr. was on our team at that time. And he was just knocking them out of the ballpark. And he came to bat first time or second time, home run. And, of course, the Mariners fans went crazy and uh, thought, well, maybe we have a chance. And bloody heck if he didn't do a hit a second homer. <laughs> I think he went two for four and two of them were home runs that he after they got beat still, but <laughs> it made the whole evening worth it. The seven dollar beers and the all the mess and the traffic and that of getting down to it and getting home. I, I think everybody who lives in an AL city has had a Yankee fan experience like yeah. that. My my kids were shocked the first time they <laughs> saw it. We went to Camden Yards and it was about 50-50 Yankees and oh. Orioles fans and yeah. the the Orioles lost 15 to 3 yeah. and uh the Yankees fans were um celebratory maybe yeah. is the right word. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I've enjoyed going into Baltimore and going into a pub near the ballpark <clears throat> with my Seattle hat on. And I, I get a lot of sympathetic. <laughs> 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 it, it's fun to meet the Orioles fans because they're, they are sympathetic for a lot of the years that we've had the same issues. And a, and a dedicated, dedicated bunch. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned earlier you were at Purdue for a while. I know you spent some time in Minnesota as well. You spent a lot of time in the Midwest. What is the coldest weather you have ever experienced in your life? Wow. Well, it was in Minneapolis. Uh, My gosh, what year was that? Well, it's probably 1962, 61 or 62. Uh, I lived off campus with two roommates and um, uh, it wasn't any even worth, it was about 10 or 12 blocks away. So it wasn't worth driving because you have to park so far away anyway, about the same distance as you might as well walk it. So I got a bicycle and I rode in the morning uh, like I usually did. And yeah, it was a little cold. I heard the forecast before I left, it said 33 below. And I thought, wow, well, if I walk, I'm going to be 
frozen by the time I get there. I might as well ride. So I got on my bike and started pedaling, and I got it. I wasn't sure, you know, it was one of those skinny tire bicycles, <laughs> and I wasn't sure the tires were going to last because it was every all, whatever little snow we had was frozen. It was unbelievably hard, and boy, I thought if, a tire is going to burst. You know, I didn't think of you know, okay, it's shrinking, <laughs> <laughs> so the pressures. <laughs> is reducing and so on but i i managed to get in there without dying but 33 below i've never been in weather that cold sense or i i hope never to experience it again. <laughs> you could have just pedaled really hard to speed up and uh increase the friction <laughs> yeah, and warm well, up the tire <laughs> i didn't even think of that but i can't imagine how fast you would have had to go in 33 below <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it, you're all bundled up anyway, and so by the time I got to campus, I was I was pretty warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. We're glad you made it through. Yeah, yeah. So another another cool thing that you got to do. You're an alumnus of the special program in soil mechanics at Harvard, which was directed oh. by Arthur Casagrande. What is something about Casagrande that impressed you that other people might not know about him? Well, they probably know that he had a reputation of being quite formal. He would call uh, students in the class Mr. or or Miss or um, Professor or Doctor or whatever their title was. And he made a point of, of using the correct title. Uh, some were military officers and he would call them Major or Captain or whatever their title was. And everything was very formal, uh, except... I have to say, at parties, uh, the faculty had a, one party for the, all the students in the class. They could bring their spouses or girlfriends, and uh, most of them were men in the class. Uh, when um, uh, and a, a couple of the parties were organized by the students for the faculty, it's kind of a thank you, thank you for them. And Professor Casagrande was the the women loved him. <laughs> He was the most charming, outgoing, friendliest guy that they it, they it could imagine because they've been hearing all these horror stories from us. Everybody, we were scared to death of the guy. It was very formal, still had this kind of heavy German accent, which I can't imitate. We were scared to death of him. And he was just the kindest, most outgoing, almost a party guy <laughs> you wouldn't believe. <laughs> it wasn't because he drank a lot or anything like that. He just loved talking to women and the wives and finding out about them and their, if they had children and all this. I mean, just a real personable fellow. That was a real surprise because he was certainly different in the classroom. <laughs> well, it's good. I mean, I think it's it's interesting when people are that way because yeah. I feel like I have the exact same personality all the time. It doesn't matter whether I'm talking to a cabinet official or my yeah. kids, uh, I'm yeah. exactly the same. And maybe there's something to be said for being able to switch it on and switch it off. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. But uh, it was a quite a formal organization and way things happened in, uh, in the little group, in the professors where they were and the secretary. Secretary was always, uh, he said, addressed her as miss and things like that. She, the students didn't. <laughs> that is excellent. Funny. Yeah. So the other question that we ask everybody during these interviews is how did you first get involved in ASCE and then GI? Oh, well, ASCE was, uh, I guess, being a uh, student chapter member and um, in civil engineering, I studied as an undergraduate and so uh, yeah, just something you did. And um, I was kind of slow in getting my membership transferred to associate member. <laughs> and because uh, they, they didn't have the junior member anymore, but they had the associate member. And, and you, could, you got a free one year if you managed to transfer your membership within a certain time. Well, I didn't do that. And by the time I got around to, to uh, taking care of it, I passed that whatever that little window was, and I had to uh, pay the full fare, which wasn't a lot, $35 or something. It wasn't a lot of money. 
And, uh, <clears throat> but I didn't get really active until I started uh, teaching at Sacramento State College, as it was called then, Cal State Sacramento now. Uh, with a master's degree, I was filling in for a guy that had gone back to do get a PhD. And um, the faculty there said, oh, we're going down for Sacramento section lunch. They have a lunch meetings in that particular section. I said, oh, OK. He said, you're an ASC member. And yeah, well, come on down with us. So I don't know, you paid something for the lunch and, and enjoyed the technical program that a lot of places have now and or in those days, they did then instead of evening meetings mm -hmm. like we have here. And um, so, uh, gee, those were really a lot of fun. I got kind of excited about it and, you know, everything else, uh, you know, just kind of followed after that. I got involved in some committees and uh, some of the local things. And especially when I was a grad student at Northwestern uh, after my time at Harvard, the um, that group is a very, very active geotechnical group of, of the Seattle, of the, I guess it's a <clears throat> Illinois section, but whatever the branch is up in Chicago. Right. And they had a very active geotechnical group with a lecture series. And I think that was the group I gave my first professional talk to <laughs> that I bothered to put on my resume <laughs> to talk to them about Orville Dam or something where I'd worked on in California. So. Yeah, I'd, and then I'd say what about from then on? What or, about GI after oh, that? Oh, GI. Well, because I, I think asked, you probably got quite a few stories to tell about that. Well, I got asked by the uh, XCOM at that time, still of the executive committee of the old division, to join. Uh, that's when uh, Ray Kryzik was uh, on the uh, XCOM, uh, Marcusen. There were a lot of people that were involved at that time. And um, <clears throat> so uh, they asked me to join, and, and the uh, person that was r right before me was Priscilla Nelson. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and um, uh, oh, well, there were several other people, uh, Ron Smith, uh, uh, the guy that one of the fellows that was on work for the ASCE. Oh, Larry, uh, Larry Roth, probably. Larry Roth, yeah. And so uh, we were going through the motions of trying to organize the GI. And, oh, I, I, you know, I take the, all the rest of the time telling stories about that. And they, they aren't real kind to ASCE uh, because th this was a real new experiment on the part of, mm -hmm. of Jim Davis at that time to start this institutes. And they chose the structures and the geotech group to do to be the guinea pigs, I guess, and see if they could work it out. And the board was very hostile. The board of direction was very hostile to the to the formation of the Institute. And uh, things that we thought would work out OK didn't. And but many, many other things I think we've done exceptionally well. And uh, so I worked my way up through the officer rank until what was it, 2001 or so, and then about that time, Harvey Walls retired from the from the um, <clears throat> as an international secretary, and I took it took it over then. And I, I I serve at the pleasure of the board of governors. Uh, they, they can get rid of me anytime they want. They they're the boss. I guess they're my boss as far as that <laughs> <activity> is concerned. <laughs> But we love having you there. You're a fantastic resource. And, you know, we've we've survived 25 years now as GI. you got to show everybody the shirt that you wore for yeah. the interview today. These are the ones we had at Geo Congress in Minnesota. Yeah. In case somebody didn't pick one up yeah. someday when we all get together again, <laughs> there will be more we'll available. More of Good. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice shirt. <clears throat> Wonderful design. So. So you've. You've been in the Seattle area for quite a while. You started at University of Washington in 1988, I think. Mm -hmm. I think when a lot of people think of Seattle, they think of the 1990s because that Seattle was everywhere. I mean, that was Seattle was the pinnacle <clears throat> of cool, whether yeah. it was Microsoft <laughs> or Starbucks, the music industry. I mean, even Frasier. Um, yeah. 
there were movies. It, it, it was everywhere. Not sleepless. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, do you have a story about one of those? What were the 90s like in Seattle for you? Well, you you, you mentioned Starbucks uh, and, and Microsoft. I, you know, I bought shares in those companies back when they'd gone, undergone a, a split or so, and so the shares were fairly inexpensive, and I'm really been glad I did. Uh, you know, so that money has come in very handy at times. But uh, the the Starbucks thing was a real surprise, and uh, we had had a sabbatical in Italy for a couple of years and or a year and a summer, gone back in the following summer because we loved Italy, and the coffee there is really really good, <laughs> right. even little hole in the walls coffee shops or bars would have good coffee. And we got to Seattle, and we were, I think this was when we were looking for a house, uh, and before classes had begun, and we stopped in a place said, oh, they have espresso, let's try it. It was good. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And I talked to some friends, and they said, yeah, there's a company here called Starbucks that started s- selling good coffee, and not, as the Italians would call it, hot brown water, which was <laughs> the way most American coffee was in those <laughs> And gosh, you could get decent coffee. And, and that, well, there's a nice story on how Starbucks started because they didn't really advertise much. They just started using their coffee or giving their coffee to co- restaurants. And you'd order the hot brown water at the end of a meal and you'd say, wow, this is really good. Where, where'd you buy, what's this coffee? And they'd say, oh, the company is just starting Starbucks. That's how it got started. And pretty soon the, whole city is kind of caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> and then within years, they ruled the world. <laughs> yeah, they've done well. They really have. In fact, they've got an annual meeting coming up in, in uh, the, it's on St. Patty's Day in this March, and I'm thinking about attending. I haven't been in several years. The real in-person per, in Starbucks meetings were a lot of fun. But I won't go into any details on that. <laughs> Microsoft. We'll, we'll have to do a. We'll have to do another one of these sometime. Yeah. I can tell you a couple of Microsoft stories too, but they weren't. Their meetings weren't near as much fun as <laughs> Starbucks. Said. So you were the 2010 Terzaghi lecturer on your long list of awards and uh, honors. Has anything surprising happened to you because of that lecture award, or what venue where you gave the lecture was the most fun? Or you can answer oh. both of those. <laughs> okay. Um, what was the first part? <laughs> the venue, Has anything venue, surprising happened oh, to you because yeah, of that I think, award? I think what surprised me, uh, well, I mean, first, it's uh, I was so surprised to, to get it and, and then prepare the lecture. I had a lot of problems associated with the presentation because the, the um, oh, they, there were some difficulties with that particular venue. It was in... Uh, West Palm Beach, and apparently the AV system didn't work quite well, and some of the previous speakers were really awful. And so I'd gone gone in to go through this, and and then of course the software was different than my software, and the quality of the yeah, you know, I mean it was just a long thing, and I was so nervous um, that I probably didn't do a real great job. There's supposedly a video of that somewhere that John Durant had made, and it might have been so bad that they <laughs> erased it or lost it, but <laughs> you can put that on your collection. of. Yeah, you know, I got to go hunting for it, because I was yeah. going to say, that's the last year that we don't have on uh, our YouTube channel. Well, there's one, there's somewhere, but anyway, I guess as far as venues were concerned, it, it led to some surprising invitations for conferences, uh, for example, in South America and Europe and so on. To, to give it and present it. But the best one was the Australians. The Australian Geomechanics Society <clears throat> invites either the ranking lecture or the Tatsagi lecture to go around the country and give talk. And they invited me to come down. So venues, Brisbane, Newcastle, Sydney, Hobart, Tasmania, out to Melbourne, Adelaide and then around to Perth and the, on the West Coast uh, gave us a chance to see parts of Australia that we'd never seen. 
And and the other thing is, they he apologized. The guy that arranged this was there, like you, their director. Right. He said, um, <clears throat> uh, it, we, if you want to bring your wife, you can, but I'm sorry, we, we can't afford two business class tickets. <laughs> So if you want to bring your wife, you're going to have to sit in the back of the airplane. I said, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I was so amazed because I expected to pay her way. Of course, you know, it just, it just, it blew me away. We had a wonderful time driving, learning to drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and just some really great, great stories and great uh, things that we saw in both Tasmania and out in the West. I'd love to go back, spend some more time there. So then you guys went through part of the interior of the country then. You weren't just on the coast. No, mainly that's where you go around the coast and that, yeah, that, that particular time I, we've been to the interior to Ayers Rock and that area out there, but, um, that was on previous visits, but yeah, it's, you know, the continental U S and continent of Australia are about the same. Right. I mean, you start flying and you, you know, keep going and going and going. You think, where are we? You know, <laughs> when are we going to get there? <laughs> and a lot of a lot of irrigation needed in both places. Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> really? You know, I grew up in Arizona and New Mexico. I'm used to desert, but our deserts are are vibrant and alive right. compared to that <laughs> you know, Australian desert. I mean, that is a real desert. So we, we're going to close out with a couple of fun ones. Usually we don't have two fun ones in a row, but we kind of had three or four fun ones in a row here. When was the last time you ate fast food and what did you order? Well, it was last Monday of, or Monday of this week. I happened to be in Seattle, pick up my nephew at the, at the airport and uh, had done some shopping for my wife and so on. And I was going to, on my way to to go by the house, pick up the mail and a few things that we, because we've <clears throat> spent, we uh, self-isolate out here in, in a community. It's about uh, 60 miles away from uh, Seattle called Port Townsend. And um, I drove by Kid Valley Hamburgers, which is a kind of a local chain. It's one of my favorites. And I got a double cheeseburger, bacon, blah, 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 you know, and <laughs> bread everything, <laughs> and, you know, everything on it and took it home and sat down and I could eat it, you know, be a pig and fill my, it was full of all sorts of artery clogging stuff. <laughs> I don't do that very often. I got to say that. I, but I think you have to do it every now and then. Once in a, <laughs> once in a while, you got to. And that was, so that's the last time you were, usually I would say, oh, it's uh, so far ago, long ago, I forgot. But this time I could say, yes, it just happened last Monday. But that is excellent. You got in a shout out for, what was it, Kid Valley? Kid Valley hamburgers at local joint here. So anybody who goes to Seattle has to give that a shot, it sounds it, like. It'd be worth it. Better than Dick's or any of the other, you know, the what do you call it, good guys or some of that stuff. In, in my home. No, hey, five, five Guys is a DC uh, original, so I, I won't have any of that slander on okay. this interview. <laughs> well, I, ha con uh, I have to tell you, I have not tried Five Guys, so I don't know how good they are. It's pretty good. I don't okay. know how it is in other places because I'm, I'm not sure I've ever had it anywhere except this area. But okay, I, I'm going to trust that they keep the quality up in other okay. places, too. Yeah, they should. I hope <laughs> so. The, the final one, our final question. Did you get to visit the USSR or any Eastern European countries when they were under communist regimes? And what was the most memorable thing about those oh, visits? My. Well, that that could take a half hour to tell all those stories. Uh, yes, I was there uh, uh, once in Estonia with a, an ex-girlfriend uh, who was from Estonia, uh, which is part of the Baltics, it's close to right. Finland. And uh, that was uh, surprising. Uh, well, uh, and then I went back for the, uh, an international conference on soil mechanics uh, in um, 1973 with a, a group from Scandinavia. So everything was organized, the, the trip, the tickets and everything, we just paid through the society, 
the Swedish Geotechnical Society organized this. And um, when I was in, in uh, uh, Moscow, uh, I took some time off and went to uh, the local department store, GUM, the big uh, government yep. run thing on Red Square is a very famous, I don't know, eight story high building or something. And and I went in to buy some toys or, or some children's books or something for my daughter. I'd like to do that. She was about five or six at that time or four, I guess. So anyway, uh, go in and they have the most complicated system you could ever imagine. So you say, OK, I want this and this and this and you go to pay for it. Oh, they don't take money. They write you a, a tab or a ticket or something, and you take that to the cash register. So you have to stand in line again while there's a guy in there or a gal that takes your money. And then they write paid or whatever they do on that. And I take that slip back, have to stand in line again at the place to get you whatever you bought. I mean, talk about designing a system that must be frustrating as heck for the Russians. Yeah. And they speak the language. And right away you start to think, boy, there's, and they, they put a, they got a rocket up there and it was Sputnik before our, our guys got off there, off the ground. You know, I mean, they were whomping us in the space race and everything. I'm thinking, boy, that's crazy. You know, although now we'd had a man on the moon by then, you know, 73. So, so I guess we were ahead there at least, but I don't, I don't think, I think we were somehow, and this is an experience of several of my colleagues from Purdue that said, you know, you go there once and you think, and we're f afraid of these guys. <laughs> it's a very incompetent system. You know? And yet they were able to do a lot of fantastic things in the space race and, and militarily. And that's where all the resources obviously went. And I think the more time passes, the more we realize that we were both afraid of each other. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, even in yeah. the even in the late 80s, I think, yeah. you know, when I was yeah. a oh, yeah. kid becoming a teenager, it's very bizarre that that system was so close to collapsing. And mm -hmm. we largely had no idea. It was. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, where was I CIA? What were they? What were they spying on? You know, I mean, what, you know, they should have they should have told. uh, uh First President Bush, you know, the wall's going to come down. <laughs> Real <soon. laughs> yeah. But that is fantastic. That, that was a great story. And uh, I mean, it just must have been a completely otherworldly yeah. experience at that yeah. time. Well, the other thing I was thinking about this ahead of time, obviously, a little. And the other visit was to Poland in the mid 80s. And that, that was a, a poll that had worked. In Sweden, when I was at the at the Swedish Geotechnical Institute that I kept in contact with, Boleslav uh, uh, Mazukevich, and he was a, a, a harbor engineer doing a lot of work on harbors in Gdynia and Gdansk up there on the Baltic shipyards. And he wrote a couple of books on dry docks and, you know, that kind of thing, heavy construction stuff. And uh, so he tells this story at a dinner party about the the Russian and the Pole that were out in the woods and they found a cache of gold. And so the Russian puts his arm on the Pole's shoulder and says, we'll split this like brothers. And the Pole looks up and he said, no, no, please, 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> because Mazakevich used to tell me they would be, take hard currency, which they had a hard time getting, buy sheet sheeting in Denmark or or Germany, ship it to somewhere, and it ended up probably in Vietnam. As a, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't expect that. End up in Vietnam. Uh, caught, oh, no, I can't answer it. I'll let my wife answer it. Sorry. I don't know how to do that. That's okay. I'll turn it off. I'm sorry. One more ring, and then it'll be off. <laughs> so anyway, I... Um, <clears throat> the uh, the other th thing that they I, well the uh, I you know I, anyway that that must have been terrible that they had to do that you know and that was the the brother you know big brother was going to take care of us you know and then they ended up t taking most of their hard work 
you know, big brother will take care of you. Well, from the Poles' point of view, that wasn't very realistic. But let me tell you one other little quick story. Sure. <clears throat> they have a, a, their jokes are fantastic. It's that kind of thing. They've got a political twist or something associated with it. And <clears throat> one of the other, there were two, uh, a party leader at that time and uh, the premier or the whatever, prime minister, uh, one was called Girek and one was called Gromulka. And I, I don't know which one it was, but let's say Girek is, goes out in Warsaw in the capital and goes in this uh, square at night and uh, it's deserted. And there's this, that's in the middle of the square is a pillar with a, somebody standing up there with a sword and you know, kind of a medieval guy. And uh, turns out it's a king, Wenceslas. And uh, uh, this guy, Girix, down there wandering around, and he hears this voice saying, bring me a horse. Bring me a horse. Because the statue is standing on, <laughs> uh, you know, he's on foot. And the, he said, what? And he goes up and he says, my gosh, it's the statue saying, bring me a horse. He goes back the next morning, sees the other guy, sees Gomulka and says, tells him the story. And Gomulka said, you just had too much vodka. You're crazy. He said, no, come with me tonight and we'll go into the square and see. And so they go in there and they hear, bring me a horse. Bring me a horse. And they get up real close there and the statue says, I said a horse, not an ass. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. We we have had a we have had a complete interview here today. I feel like now. <laughs> yeah, I think with that, let's let's end it. <laughs> well, you you survived all the questions. We've had a perfect one hundred percent survival rate on director's right. cut so far, which is something to strive for. Very good. Thanks all the viewers for sticking with us all the way through as you always do. Again, if you liked what you saw today, click that subscribe button, click get notifications. We will let you know every time we post something to our YouTube channel. We have a lot of other great content up here too. We don't have Bob's Terzaghi lecture, but we have about 10 years of other Terzaghi lectures. You can go check those out. Buchanan lectures, uh, live stream content that we've archived from the past year. There's a lot of great stuff up there. Good. So thanks again, Bob, for being oh, with us today. Welcome. We appreciate very it. Very welcome. It's, it's been fun for me too. So now I'll go take advantage of what's left of the. That looks like we've lost our sun. So it's supposed to start raining. <laughs> As I'm sure it goes a lot in Seattle. Yeah. That's the time of year. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you next week.